This is an animal horn. And this is the shape of a horn, basically, except now it goes right round. It's also the name of the instrument. Quite why anybody should have made a sound on this is pure conjecture. There's nothing inside to make a sound. But if you vibrate your lips, in other words, if you buzz your lips into one end, you can produce quite a loud sound. Now, we do know that this sort of instrument, really uh, just a basic animal horn, was used for signaling. The other instrument, which is, in a sense, uh, old, because we know that it goes back and back and back, is this uh, seashell. Again, why anybody would have wanted to make a sound out of, or worked out how to, is guesswork. But they would have had to break the end off here, where it came out like that. And perhaps they picked up this shell and said, I wonder what's in here. And perhaps tried to talk through it. But miraculously, it went an even louder sound. Now, the Pacific Islanders and the New Guinea used conch shells, seashells. Europeans used animal horns for signaling, rapid sounds for danger, and various sort of Morse code effects. Yes, because when you said you couldn't see why they were doing it, I could see, uh, uh, as you yourself have yeah, said, that yeah. the signal was one of the... Uh, reasons why they would want to employ it, because the sound carries fine. In fact, the signalling uh, value of the horn, the signalling quality of the horn, was what uh, marked it out for many centuries after that, wasn't it? We have some more here, signalling instruments, right up to the hunting horn. Well, signalling and ceremonial. Um, this is uh, a shofar. It was used, in the, going back to the Old Testament, um, in, in the Jewish services. But this one's longer, and you'll hear that there are actually more notes that you can get. All these horns, actually, even the short ones, have theoretically a number of notes that you can get. But it's not humanly possible to. This is a bit longer. Again, it's got that basic conical shape. This is a ram's horn, very much longer. And you can get a little more variety of sound and, and extra notes. Length is clearly the distinguishing factor of the Swiss Alp horn. Does the fact that that's an almighty long uh, tube, uh, does that mean that it gives, does the length of the tube give the difference in sound? No. What it does is to provide you with a lot of notes. Because what we're playing, uh, what we call a harmonic series, and these exist theoretically on every tube. But on a very short tube, you can perhaps get one, sometimes two sounds. I've got some short ones there that might actually... Um, explain it a bit. This this one here <coughs> is certainly the shortest. That's a, an English hunting horn. And I can't play a tune on this. I can get one sound. There are other notes, but they're so high up that they're beyond my physical capabilities. How do you actually get a sound out of it? Do you uh, spit in it or just blow in it? Or what's the, what's the activity that goes on between your mouth and the end of that, uh, and that mouthpiece? That's the difference. I mean, there's nothing in there, but you go and you get. And the musical development took place basically on the hunting field, didn't it? Yes. They made instruments longer and longer. And this is uh, really the, the culmination of the, of the art of building signal instruments, a, a French hunting horn. In this case, you'll notice it's also got some rather beautiful decoration inside the bell. <coughs> They were meant to look good as well as to be efficient. But this shape actually works very well because they, they, they played them like this. 
Having made the signal, put it over the shoulder and gallop away. The hunt in France in particular had become very much the gentleman's pursuit. And anyone who was anybody had horn players to play quite complicated hunting horn calls. They all varied, it was different, different way the tune went, but different would be the meaning. It was really like a walkie-talkie, it was a way, means of communicating. And these horn players played very, very loud, very raucously. Little by little, it was tamed from this very, very raucous instrument into a very beautiful musical instrument. And so, by the time we come to the 18th century, people like Telemann in particular were writing pretty good music for the horn, not only within the orchestra, but as uh, a solo instrument. hasn't got really a hunting uh, flavor to it at all. I think they were trying to get away from this. Uh, and uh, other composers also, they didn't write these hunting um, motives. Uh, and I think that the horn player said, no, look here, I'm not a raucous, rough outdoor player. I'm really, I'm a, I'm a musician. Play, give me something to play. Uh, and so they, they really wrote for them as uh, musicians. Telemann wrote for the hunting horn, but the instrument's range was very restricted. There were problems. Illustrated again by this simple horn, which is pitched in the key of D. You can only get these certain notes, what we call a harmonic series. Here, as, as the sound, as I go up and up and up, the notes are getting closer and closer together. You can't get any other notes. For instance, between here and here, I can try as much as I will, and I won't get anything. I'll keep on slipping onto one or other sound. I just can't get it. This means that you can only play a few notes. You can only play in one key. So if Everybody's playing in D, it's fine. <laughs> they all go into F minor. The horns didn't play. They put their instruments down. They had to rest. 